All right, if there is anybody out there uh, in the hall, you could come on in. Uh, we're going to get started in just a second. Come on in, find a seat. We'll begin in just a moment. <laughs> it's good. He's got it. He's got it. Got it. That's it, guys. All right. Hi. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joseph Perry. Uh, I'm president of the Serve Initiative, and uh, thank you and uh, welcome to uh, the Third Education Revolution. This is a it's a book launch event, but it's a lot more than that. Uh, so the purpose of this event is not to simply launch a book, but a movement, and to cast a vision that initiates a conversation, acting as a beacon that will gather those in the church to come together as one to take back education for the kingdom of God and to disciple nations through this institution. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Thank you for the enthusiasm. Tonight we will hear from a number of speakers, both local and extra local. Uh, we've had, uh, we have uh, Vishal Mangawadi all the way in from California. We've got speakers that have uh, driven in for this uh, as well. And uh, I think some of you have driven in uh, quite far as well for this. Um, uh, these speakers are all experts in their field who've band together in a book to lend their knowledge and wisdom in the area of education. Each one is an author contributor to tonight's book with Vishal Mangawadi as a visionary leading this particular project. Uh, tonight's event is being co-hosted by the Serve Initiative, uh, also the Foundation for American Christian Education, otherwise known as FACE, and the Providence Foundation with Stephen McDowell. Um, I want to tell you just uh, a little bit about each one real quick before we get started. So the Serve Initiative is a Christian reformation movement that exists for the welfare and human flourishing of cities and nations. Serve exists to solve problems, engage communities, reform institutions, voice truth, and empower others. The Foundation for American Christian Education, FACE, uh, their vision is to raise an army of individual lives prepared to build the family, the church, and the nation through education in a biblical theistic worldview to glorify God above all and bless the people by applying wise principles to all areas of life. The Providence Foundation is a Christian educational organization whose mission is to train network leaders to transform, to train and network leaders to transform their culture for Christ and to teach all citizens how to disciple nations. They've been working since their inception in 1983 to fulfill Christ's commission to make disciples of all nations. Such nations will have transformed people, but also transformed institutions, family, church, and state. The foundation is focused on training and networking leaders in a principled biblical education that has historically produced liberty, justice, prosperity, virtue, and knowledge in people and nations. Uh, before we go any further tonight, is there anybody that did not receive a program because you'll need one for tonight's event? Anybody? Just raise your hand. Brian, could you uh, get a uh, program to anybody who did not get one? They have QR codes and information about what we're doing tonight. I'll take just a minute for that. We have a few more over here. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see that hand. I was a pastor for a while. I have to say that. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, at this moment, I'd like to invite Dr. John McLeod. He's the pastor here at Grace River Church to come and open us in prayer. Would you please stand? Father God, you are creator of all things. And Lord, we just pray that tonight you would open our hearts, our minds. We welcome you into this place. God, we pray that you be magnified. We pray that you be glorified. Lord, let us hear your word. Let us hear your vision. Let us hear what the word of God is saying. And through each speaker, God, I just pray that you allow us to see the future of what you are doing in the world around us, Lord. 
The world is in trouble, but we are not in fear. We are here tonight in hope. We are here tonight in victory through Jesus Christ and what you are doing through education in this world. Now, bless it, strengthen us, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, the strong Son of God. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, John. <clears throat> All right, so our first speaker tonight, uh, and one of the uh, chapter contributors to the book and this project and this movement is uh, Steve McDowell. Steve McDowell is co-founder and president of the Providence Foundation. Uh, he has trained people from 100 countries to apply biblical truth in all spheres of life. He has consulted with government officials, assisted in writing political documents, advised political parties, and aided in starting Christian schools and biblical worldview training centers. He has authored and co-authored over 40 books, videos, and training courses, including Liberating the Nations, America's Providential History, and Ruling Over the Earth, a biblical view of civil government. Stephen's books and writings have been translated into 18 languages and distributed to more than 1 million people. McDowell holds a master's degree in geophysics, served for several years as a pastor, and has been an adjunct professor at Regent University. Please welcome Dr. Stephen McDowell. Well, good evening, everybody. Good to be with you, and I'm going to jump right in since we have limited time, but I'm going to start by giving us an example, especially if we can bring those slides up. Are you going to bring the, the main slides up in the front or just on the side? Of um, how the founders of America launched a revolution by doing this, what Vishal and others will be sharing with you, uh, recapturing education and using it as a means to extend God's kingdom and the earth. So how the Bible educated America to live in liberty. <laughs> liberty is not the default state of fallen man. If you leave man to himself, he will not move toward liberty. In fact, he'll move the opposite direction. There will be a downward spiral into more bondage and lack. So man must be educated to live in liberty. Paul writes in Colossians 2.8, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So what we see here is that a worldly, man-centered philosophy brings captivity. But a Christian philosophy brings liberty. Now, when we look at the definition of liberty, as Noah Webster defined it in his original dictionary, and he defines words biblically, he reveals this to us. He said, education comprehends all that series of instruction and discipline which is intended to enlighten the understanding, correct the temper, form the manners and habits of youth, and fit them for usefulness in their future stations. This is what biblical education should do. In fact, this definition corresponds very well with what Paul writes to Timothy, the Word of God does for us. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So biblical education forms the inner man, gives, you know, gives us the character that we need. It, it shapes our worldview so that we think right, so that we can act right, and it fits us to accomplish our mission in the earth. This is what God's Word does. This is what biblical education does, and this is what prepares men to live in liberty. As Thomas Jefferson said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. So we can never be a free people if we are ignorant, ignorant of truth, not just of knowledge and facts and other things. We have a lot of educated idiots today. A lot of them are trying to run the nation. Education is a sowing and reaping process. It's like a seed. The seed you plant determines the fruit that is produced. We know this is a very important principle in the Bible. It's taught uh, everywhere. So we need to recognize the great potential in the seed. I love the saying that someone once said, you can count how many seeds are in an apple 
but you cannot count how many apples are in a seed. One seed has the potential of producing millions of pieces of fruit. This is the power of education in, in the truth. So we shouldn't be surprised, as someone once said, the philosophy of the schools in one, one generation will be the philosophy of government in the next. So we're not surprised what's going on in our government today or in the media or in Hollywood or anywhere else because we know what seeds were planted within them in the educational establishment in the years past. Biblical education will implant morals and a biblical worldview. It prepares us to live in liberty. And so here's some components, basic components necessary for a people to live free. Christian character, biblical worldview, and being equipped to fulfill their calling, biblical vocation. So today, you know, Americans need to have a liberal arts education. Now, today, when you use that word liberal, it means leftist in the political sense of the word. It's not a good thing. But it used to mean something good. When people went to colleges in early America, they received a liberal arts education, which meant they were equipped to live in liberty. If you went to Harvard or Dartmouth, Princeton, William and Mary, it didn't matter where you went, you received the character, the worldview, equipping to fulfill your calling so that the nation might be free. They received a liberal arts education. We need that today, but unfortunately, Americans are being educated to live socialistically. In socialism, statism, where man is his own savior and he looks to uh, man via the state to save him. So the key to America's great liberty, prop, uh, prosperity, and virtue was this biblical education. And so this is what today we, the church and God's people, need to be uh, to prepare the nations to move toward liberty, which is why Christ came to give us freedom, this is what education should do. I want to give you very quickly five components that are part of biblical education. And if you want to read in more detail, you can pick up a copy of the book and read it as I flesh these out. But one, education is primarily the responsibility of the family which can then delegate it to others. Parents should disciple their children. Parents have the right and responsibility to govern the education of their children. Not just the right, but the responsibility. It's primarily parents who will give an account one day to God to, how did you train your children? Well, they went down to the school down there. I didn't know they were teaching that kind of stuff. I said, well, that's not gonna, that excuse is not gonna work when we give an account. So families are the nurseries of good and bad citizens. Families are the first church, the first school, the first business, the first government. This is where we develop citizens who know how to lead the nation and live in liberty. So education was centered in the home in early America. The founding fathers were trained at home, some exclusively like George Washington, others were taught at home and it was supplemented with tutors, most were ministers. Some may have gone to school, some few, one quarter of them went to, uh, the signers went to, to college. So, but it was not only political leaders, but leaders in every area of life. Even the father of American painting, Benjamin West, said, my mother's kiss made me a painter. So whatever vocation they were called to, they were prepared in the home to accomplish their mission. John and Abigail Adams are a great example of producing the fruit of biblical education through their son, John Quincy Adams, who was trained at home, but at the age of 14 received a congressional appointment to serve as the uh, as secretary to the ambassador of Russia. And throughout his life, he served ambassador in many nations, secretary of state, U.S. senator, president, U.S. house after uh, he served in the house after he served as president, was a leader in the anti-slavery movement. But you ought to read some of his writings, things that he said when he was young. He's a product of education in the home. Two, <coughs> Parents have the right and responsibility, but then they can delegate that to others. Schools are a means of extension of family education. So the early schools in America were started by the church to provide education maybe for the orphaned or, or, or others who were not able, to, their parent, the home was not able to provide them uh, for that. 
The first school laws were passed in New England in the 1640s. The preamble of that first Massachusetts school law said it being one chief project that I, of that old deluder Satan to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures. And they said, therefore, when you get so many families, you got to start a school. So they understood the devil wants to keep people ignorant. If he can keep them ignorant, he can keep them in bondage. And they said, we can't have this, so we got to make sure everybody can read so that they can read the Bible. This is the heritage of our common schools uh, in the United States. Colleges were started to train ministers in the knowledge of the Bible. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so the, every college before independence, we, you could trace this region. Harvard was the first college. One of its original rules said, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, John 17, 3, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. Do you think they observe this at Harvard College today? Well, not at all, but th they did there. And every other college as well, UM and Mary, Yale, Princeton, Dartmouth, etc. And so college was were started to train godly ministers and for people for every area of their whatever vocation they were called to to have the character and worldview necessary for it to be productive, advance liberty, advance God's kingdom. A third component for a biblical model is education to a calling. Of course, the founders of America understood the biblical concept of calling of work which we need to restore today. I think it's summarized the best by Dr. Crawford W. Long quote. He's, his statue is in the United States Capitol, one of the many heroes that are there. He was a medical doctor. Engraved on the bottom of his statue is this, discover of the use of sulfuric ether as an anesthetic in surgery on March 30th, 1842 at Jefferson Jackson County, Georgia, USA. And then his quote, my profession is to me a ministry of, from God. So he understood God called me to the medical field. It's a ministry. So whatever God calls someone to, business and education, carpentry, it's a calling. It's a holy calling, and you need to be equipped in character and worldview to provide a needed good or service. It will elevate man and advance God's kingdom and advance liberty. And so this is very important in education as well. So whatever sphere of life that students are called to, they need to be equipped. Four, biblical education will have a biblical philosophy, methodology, and curriculum. Now, of course, we could take weeks and months, and FACE does this, a training in these things. I don't have time to deal with that. I do want to just mention how that the curriculum in early America was thoroughly biblical. The Bible was the central text that was used to train early Americans that gave birth to the most free and prosperous nation ever in history, regardless of what CRT in the pro in 1619 Project says. They weren't perfect, but the world had seen nothing like uh, this unique nation of America. And it was the Bible that provided the education necessary to produce such a nation. John Locke said, children learn to read by following the ordinary road of hornbook, primer, psalter, testament, and Bible. In the 1600s, this was the primary uh, uh, um, tool that was used to help educate children. They learned how to read from the colonial hornbook, which had an alphabet, some syllables. This it was a pictorial alphabet. And then it, the first reading in the name of of uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen, and then it had the Lord's Prayer. So that's how kids learned how to read. In 1690, the New England Primer was first published. For the next hundred years, it was the primary textbook in America. Every founding father would have used this book, sold over five million copies, thoroughly biblical, even the way they taught the alphabet, a rhyming alphabet. A, in Adam's fall, we send all. B, heaven to find the Bible mind. C, Christ crucified for sinners died, and on and on and on. Thoroughly biblical. 1783, Webster published his blueback speller. The next hundred years, it sold over 100 million copies and made Americans self-educated. And wherever it went, it and the Bible went in the settlement of this nation. It was thoroughly biblical as well. Webster's uh, dictionaries, thoroughly biblical, contains thousands of scriptural references, gives a biblical definition of words. In all the other major textbooks in early America, the Bible was the central text. And fifth point, 
of, a, of what biblical education is comprised of is it will advance God's kingdom with good fruit. Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's desires for us to bring his kingdom here on the earth, just like it is in heaven. He gave us a commission in Matthew 28, and he said that we're to go and make disciples of all the nations. And he told us how we're to do that, by teaching them all that he commanded. Not just part of it, not the easy part, all of it. And so biblical education is a means of extending God's kingdom in the earth. That's how we bring God's kingdom to earth. Man-centered, secular state education is the way to bring man's kingdom to the earth. And that's what our schools are doing today, primarily. So we need a revol revolution. Whoever controls the children controls the future, and God has given that responsibility primarily to the family. If you give the bureaucrats the children, you might, might just as well give them everything else. Might as well take out your wallet and your bank account, your liberty, and your freedom as well. So biblical education will produce good fruit. It will transform men, and it will transform nations. And Reverend John Witherspoon, the president of Princeton University, trained men for vocation. Sent many into the ministry, many into business, many into every sphere of life. And into the political sphere, Witherspoon trained one president, one vice president, 10 cabinet officers, 21 senators, 39 congressmen, 12 governors, one Supreme Court justice, one attorney general, a fifth of the signers of the Declaration, a sixth of the delegates of the Constitutional Convention, a fifth of the first Congress was trained by Reverend John Witherspoon, who was president of Princeton University, then called the College of New Jersey, very small at that time. He is an example of the impact of bringing godly fruit to the nation if you apply biblical godly education. It's happened in America centuries before in Ireland, centuries before in Israel, and even in our, our lifetime, we see this taking place in South Korea. And so, biblical education will produce good fruit because we are in a race. We're not in a 100-yard dash. It's a relay race, and we are called to pass the baton to the next generation. And the ability for this generation to understand where the racetrack is, what the baton is, we equip the next generation to, to receive the baton, and we have to equip them to pass it on as well. Because to the extent that we are successful in accomplishing that mission is the extent to which we will see God's kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven, that we might fulfill the mission that he has given to us. So there is a brief introduction to a biblical model of education, and I'd encourage you to pick up the book and, and, and read a lot of excellent ideas from many individuals. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McDowell. Our next speaker tonight uh, is Carla Perry, uh, who happens to be my wife, so I'm the lucky one. Uh, Carla Perry is a worldview revitalizer and author of Back to the Future, Rebuilding America's Stability, and her new release, The Reformation of America, um, I'm sorry, and she is an avid writer with a penetrating and thought-provoking style. Carla helps people develop healthy worldviews through biblical kingdom-based thinking. She earned her bachelor's degree from Old Dominion University, where she majored in English and minored in American history. Carla is a co-founder of the Serve Initiative, an organization designed to equip and empower believers for the work of reformation. Carla lives with her husband, Joseph, in Virginia Beach, Virginia. See how I work that? <laughs> uh, in Virginia Beach, Virginia, where we pastored for 11 years. Please welcome Carla Perry. Good evening. I am going to take a minute here and read a passage from my chapter, chapter 16, The University's Failed Worldview of Secular Humanism. And then I will continue on from there. Um, I sat riveted to the scene playing out in my classroom at Old Dominion University. Chagrin flashed upon the history professor's face. At the university's request, 
She implored her class not to engage in plagiarism. She should not have been surprised that her pleas had fallen on deaf ears. For months, she had driven home the idea that truth, and with it, history, was unknowable. The entire point of her introduction to history was that we were entering a discipline we could not master with any degree of confidence. She professed to doubt that we could uncover truth in the past because truth did not exist to be discovered, or at least was too elusive to serve as the goal of historical inquiry. But now she encountered the natural consequences of her worldview. Our teacher laid out the policies and disciplinary policies relating to plagiarism. She then opened the floor for discussion, as was her style. The room exploded with voices as students offered what they saw as valid reasons for engaging in plagiarism. I remember scribbling notes as she talked. I recognized the failure of a worldview that lacked grounding in truth. How could students be impressed upon to not steal intellectual work if there is no standard for truth? If history is unknowable and unattainable, what does intellectual property even mean? I remember that day and taking those notes, and I, was, and I knew that one day I was going to put that in a book. I was going to talk about that encounter that I had because the entire semester she just worked on every, from every angle to make us r come to the realization that she wanted us to come to, which didn't work for me, but for many students, that history wasn't worth pursuing. That even though she had her doctorate in history and was speaking at, you know, and teaching in a university and introducing us to the, the discipline of history, she didn't believe in it. She didn't believe there was a purpose for it. Her worldview couldn't contain a purpose for it. Um, and that was just one example of the many I encountered of a bankrupt worldview um, of secular humanism. History professors did not believe history knowable. Literature professors taught books had no meaning. In fact, post the postmodern worldview of the literature professors was that the author is dead. The text can be dissected. They called it deconstructed. We often use that word in the church, and we shouldn't today. Um, but they used they wanted to deconstruct the text and reimagine it in any way the reader wanted to. Um, one professor actually, she had us work through Jane Eyre, and she each group in the in the class had to take a different literary discipline and critique Jane Eyre with it. Unfortunately, I ended up in the group and was overruled, um, not wanting to choose this a literary criticism. My group wanted to talk wanted to criticize it through the lesbian theory. And if you've read Jane Eyre, there is none of that in that book. But in the university, there is no truth. It doesn't matter. We can find whatever theory we want to in it. The author is dead, and we are the ones that decide what truth is and what the book is telling us about. So I, my contribution in that group was the dissenting opinion, and I could barely slip that through with my professor allowing me to produce that instead of what the rest of the group was producing. Um, English composition fared no better. The teacher, the professors were more interested in um, debate, uh, arguing opinions between students than they were teaching grammar or um, style of writing. One English uh, composition, I took two advanced compositions trying to get a real advanced composition class. And one of the teachers um, started off class day one before she even went into the syllabus. There's no facts. And just dared the class to, to say different. And of course, I raised my hand. And because uh, she, she said, she said, if anyone says different, or let me know or something, I raised my hand. And she's like, give me a fact. And I said, today is Tuesday. And she says, it is here. <laughs> and she's like, give me another one. The class is just dead silent. So I raised my hand again. And I said, the earth is round. And she goes, did you measure it? I'm <laughs> like, what is this? I wanted to learn English. And, I'm, and she's badly philosophizing. <laughs> um, but in my immaturity, I began to blame the professors. I began to get cynical about them because I thought they were part of a massive effort to deceive the youth of America. I thought they were all working together to, to make me not get an education. Proverbs 4.19 says, The way of the wicked is like, a, is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. I could see their shackles. I could discern the failure of my professor's worldview because I was discipled in a Christian worldview. 
My mother raised me in Christian schools and homeschooling. I was never through, went through the public system. So it was very apparent the worldview clashes that I was experiencing in the university. But these professors could not give me truth. They did not have it to give. They could not teach literature, history, science, mathematics, economics from a place of truth. They were products of their own education. Secular humanism, Marxism, and postmodernism were their tutors. Their worldview was not neutral. We teach these subjects, we cannot teach these subjects from a place of neutrality. No worldview is neutral. A lot of times we think, you know, they're just teaching math or they're just teaching English. How can that infuse a worldview that has to do with truth and lies? But today we're losing the foundations for that. And so it is full of lies. Even, even basic classes that we think could be taught neutrally, they cannot be. They never could be. And that was, that was the problem. Um, truth, not neutrality, should be the goal of a healthy education. When we send our youth to the university or even K through 12 schools, they learn the worldview of their educators. Good education requires educators who are biblically trained in a holistic worldview born out of divine truth. It makes a huge difference. You can't teach these classes if you don't have uh, the understanding that truth is real. And, it, and the professors that I had, I had a few. There were some that had some good classes, but majority was a, was a clash of worldviews, was a fight to get through. I could tell lots of stories. My professors lacked the worldview that validated a discipline of history. Um, she, her, my teacher, her students understood that the world without truth, plagiarism, was not a moral wrong. But the professor still fought in that conflict where she thought she could hold to the two different realities. But her students had learned better from her than she had learned from her own teaching. Wherever truth is not integrated into academic disciplines, lies will be there instead. It's not the world's fault, it's in darkness. The question is, why do we expect the world to educate the church? Shouldn't it be the other way around? Shouldn't those with the truth educate the world? It's time for a revolution where the church is the light of the world and the rightful home of education. And that's why we're here today to, to make that shift, to share that message, and to change the world globally in education. Thank you. All right, that was great. Um, so quick commercial break. Uh, I'll just take just a minute. Here's how to purchase this book. I just want you to know ahead of time in case you know the evening gets away from us and it turns into a big party. So uh, if you have a program tonight, uh, if you have no idea, if you're the uninitiated, these are QR codes and you can scan these with the camera on your phone if you've never done this before. I think I was taught by a teenager maybe a couple years ago. Um, and so if you scan this first one here, um, uh, it'll take you to a link where you can get the book. So uh, you'll just scan that with your phone and it'll take you there. Has anybody ever, never used one of these QR codes? If you go into a uh, restaurant these days, it's only the on almost the only way you can get your menu. Um, so uh, just use your uh, camera on your phone and hold it over that. It'll pull up a link. You touch the link, it'll take you to the website and you can use a credit card. You can pay with cash. Uh, uh, back there as well if you want to. And the books are $20 and you'll use the code LAUNCH um, in there to uh, purchase the book. Uh, if you need any help with that at all, Ryan uh, is the man back there at the book table and he will help you with that uh, at the end of this. You can, you can, if you have your phone out at any time, nobody will throw anything at you. You're welcome to do that. Buy the book at any time and pick it up uh, when the event's over. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Okay, and, uh, but we do have a limit, limited number of copies. Uh, so now back to our speakers. So next, I want to introduce Jason Benedict. Jason is such a good friend, um, and uh, he is an entrepreneur and a business strategist, author, missionary, theologian, and international trainer. In the early years of their ministry in Africa, Jason and his wife, Kim, directed an interdenominational Bible school that served a number of local African denominations. 
In the early 2000s, Jason facilitated the funding and establishment of a Christian primary school in Niger. He and Kimberly also developed a field-based missionary internship that is still being used by their missionary agency today. In 2008, Jason became a strategist with the Regent University Center for Entrepreneurship, a university think tank, uh, where he co-founded the center's training-based uh, business incubator model, the BBC model. They have founded eight BBCs in seven nations. In addition to his international missions work, Jason runs his own enterprise development consulting firm. From 2009 to 2015, Jason worked in finance and investment banking and continues to consult the industry periodically. Please welcome Jason Benedict. Good evening. Wow, everything that's been shared so far has been so powerful. Sign me up. <laughs> and so, well, I am excited to share with you this evening about an unprecedented opportunity that exists in the intersection of, of kingdom business and missions. And so, um, if you can imagine the Venn diagram, you know, this, this opportunity exists right in the overlap of those two things, kingdom business and mission, both things that are very near and dear to our hearts. And so, um, if we could go to the next slide, please. The next one, one more. In 2004, we did have a formative experience that planted the seeds of what has become the chapter um, in the book entitled uh, The Business of Educating the Poor. So I, at that time, I was serving across West Africa and in the country of Niger. I don't know how much you know about the country of Niger, but Niger is 99 point eight percent Muslim country in West Africa it's in the Sahel in the Sahara Desert right there on the edge of the Sahara Desert and it is at that time was the second poorest nation in the earth and also one of the least educated countries in the world to give you a sense of the the crisis that they were having in education um, 33% of their national assembly at that time had to have readers with them whenever their lawmaking body was in session. They had to have readers sitting next to them to read the documents and so that they could make policy because 33% of their legislature was actually illiterate in that country. So it was a tremendous crisis. Um, however, one of the things that we realized after looking into the situation is that every year, the test scores for all the schools across the country would be published. And year after year, the top three schools in the country were the three Christian schools in the capital city of that nation. And so there was the, the church was enjoying this tremendous reputation of delivering quality education. And so in the midst of all that, we saw an opportunity and so in the second largest city of the country, we approached the mayor of that city and we said, we would like to start a Christian school. Um, and that, that's the groundbreaking ceremony that you can see there in the picture. We'd like to start a Christian school um, in your city. And this man, uh, a Muslim leader, was delighted that we wanted to start a Christian school in his city. And he said, well, and we asked, we said, could you provide us with some land to do this? And he said, well, in fact, I can. And so the, the city was growing in a certain direction, and he gave us the best piece of real estate in that direction that the city was growing at the time. Just signed it over to us, lock, stock, and barrel. And so we had the land to start the school. And from day one, we had a waiting list in that primary school. So when the, when the doors opened, there was a waiting list. And guess who lined up to enroll their children in this school? Well, it was all the leadership of the city, all the, the well-to-do families, all those whose children were going to be the next generation of leadership in that, in that prominent city there in that nation. And so they, they were lining up to pay us to educate their children with a Christian education, unapologetically Christian. And so every, from time to time, one of the parents would approach us with a complaint that sounded something like this. Well, you know, 
my kids come home singing these praise choruses and quoting scriptures. Could you do something to tone down Jesus a little bit in this school? And the response, the standard response was, well, um, you know, you're, you're welcome to withdraw your child from the school if you'd like to. And to which they would say, well, forget I ever said anything. Just, that's, that's all right. That's all right. Just forget I ever said anything. This school became a cash cow for, a, for the ministry and a church planting movement that was associated with that ministry there in that city. And so that planted a seed in my heart and it got the wheels turning for me along these lines. And about two and a half years ago, Kim and I were on a prayer retreat and the Lord began speaking to me about education in Africa and it was a very unusual prayer retreat because I spent most of the time in that prayer retreat looking at reports on education in Africa and doing kind of a deep dive into the research of what was going on in Africa. And so there is a tremendous opportunity in the continent of Africa right now to disciple nations. If you could go to the next slide, please. So I'd like to make the, the case to you that education is discipleship, because a lot of times this is the kind of thing you'll hear. You'll hear, well, wait a second, Jason, if we're going to do missions, shouldn't the focus be on preaching the gospel and making disciples? But my point is that education is discipleship, because whoever educates disciples, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. And so when we educate, we, we are discipling. In fact, the, the, um, the Great Commission, if you read it in the King James Version of the Bible, what does it say? It says, it says, it says make, go and teach all nations. Now, in many of the modern translations, it says, make disciples of all nations. Uh, teaching them to, to obey and observe everything I've commanded you. But this idea that, that uh, we are to teach the nations, it is our mandate. It is part of the reason the church exists, is to teach the nations and to teach truth. And, and Dr. McDowell did a wonderful job of explaining that. This is universally understood. Look at what Nelson Mandela said. Education is the most powerful weapon with which you can, you can use to change the world. And so Jesus told us to disciple nations and education is discipleship. So let, let's look a little bit at what's happening in Africa. So there, there, there is a convergence of trends in the continent of Africa right now that makes this tremendous opportunity in education. And so these are, these are some of the trends that are converging. Tremendous population growth, insufficient educational infrastructure, technology, and others, as you can see. I'd like to take a dive into each of those for just a moment. Next slide, please. So the world is becoming more African. You know, what do I mean by that? You know, population growth in Asia has been, uh, has been a headline, right, for decades. But do you realize that Asia's population growth is actually tapering off a bit? And right now, the, what's filling that void is the incredible population growth of Africa. It's the youngest continent already. It's the majority of the continent under 15 years of age. Um, or, you know, so essentially the age of education, right? That is the, that is the majority of the continent of Africa, a billion people. But what's going to happen in the next 30 years? Well, there will be another billion Africans born in the next 30 years. The three decades. Just take, take a moment and let that sink in. In the next three decades, there will be another billion Africans. And so there is a massive, massive number of people, students, if you will, that will need to be educated in the continent of Africa in 30 years. And so my question is, Who's going to educate them? Someone will. Someone will educate them. But and who is going to educate them? And so I say, let it be the church. Because after all, it's our commission, right? It is our commission to disciple the nations or to teach the nations. And so, so you, that's one of the factors, this massive population growth, uh, 
already young population across the continent. Next slide, please. You combine that with an insufficient educational infrastructure in the continent of Africa. They have the lowest net enrollment rates in the world. So the World Bank and, uh, um, and a number of different organizations globally, the UN, uh, for example, they track net enrollment rates. That means how many school-aged people are actually in school within a continent. And Africa has the lowest net enrollment rates in the world. If you could go to the next slide. The, so there is this incredible capacity gap. Without diving too much into this, if you look at the current capacity for education in Africa, which, like I said, is the lowest in the world, although it's rapidly increasing, and that's part of the story here, but it's the lowest in the world, and you look at the, the number of new children that are going to be born in Africa, um, and the current age, the, the current population, what that adds up to is that in the next 30 years, there's going to be 800 million people seeking education, and the capacity isn't there right now. Now, what does, how will we respond as the church to this incredible need to educate 800 million people? Just let that question hang in your thinking for a moment. Let's go to the next slide. Another one of the trends that is incredible is the explosion of technology in Africa. I remember um, being on a bus traveling across a portion of the Sahara Desert in the middle of the night. It was pitch black, and all of a sudden, the inside of the, the bus glowed blue. And I said, what's going on? And I looked around me, and everybody was turning on their cell phones. Well, they, the people that were the regular passengers on this bus understood that we were going to go in proximity to a cell tower. You know, and they knew they knew where that cell tower was, and so everybody was waiting to text. You know, and they all were lighting their phones up in the middle of the night on this bus trip, and and so, well, that was many years ago, and it's it's accelerated. There are something I forget the exact number, but there's um, and maybe I have it here. Yeah, 200 million smartphone users today in Africa, and it's expected to be 690 million. Um, in just a few years. And so there's this, it's, it's, when I'm with my African friends, they will have two and three smartphones, you know, with them in the restaurant. We're, we're meeting or having coffee or something. They'll have two or three smartphones on the table. And so there's this incredible explosion of technology and the availability of technology there in bandwidth. And so Africa is the last, con to put that in perspective, Africa is the last continent to step across the digital divide. But it's happening rapidly. It's happening right now as we speak. They're stepping across the digital divide and now have access to the internet. internet. What that means is an entire generation that hasn't had access to bandwidth now suddenly are flooded with it. And it's cheap. It's cheap. I mean, I, my, I'm staggered by my... Uh, my digital, the bill that I get for the digital package that I pay for my smartphone here in this country. But over in Africa, you get, for a fraction of that amount, you can buy uh, similar speeds and similar amounts of data, you know, maybe like a tenth of the cost. And so these are all factors that are happening. Next slide, please. Another thing that's happening is there's an emerging middle class. That means there's an emerging middle class of people who are able to pay for education. And what do people do when, when you know, when, if, if there's a, uh, a downturn in the economy, the very last thing that people cut off is education for their children. So what that means is education is a very resilient sector. If you're going to, if you're going to invest in a business sector, you know, it's one of the first things people pay for when they have a little bit of disposable income. It's one of the last things they're willing to cut whenever things are, are tough. They'll cut a lot of other things before they cut education for their children. And so there's this emerging middle class that are ready to be educational consumers in Africa. And so, next slide. Now, this opportunity has by and large eluded the American church. I could give you some exceptions to that rule. I could, I could name off some people who get it and are, who are beginning to mobilize around this opportunity. 
But by and large, the American church and the American mission movement, I'm part of that movement, is oblivious to this opportunity. But it has not gone unnoticed. In fact, there's been a 5,000% increase in foreign direct investment in the educational sector in Africa in recent years. That's right, you heard me right. A 5,000% increase in foreign direct investment in the African educational sector in the last few years. That investment is coming from the Middle East and from Asia, predominantly from people that have worldviews that are hostile to the gospel. They're hostile to a biblical worldview. And so they are, by, for example, a large, a prominent uh, primary school in Kenya was just purchased for like $26 million by a Saudi investment banking firm in the last couple of years. Just one example of many deals, $26 million deal to purchase a primary school. Now, the, pe the reason why people are interested in investing is it, it in it is in this sector is that the returns are really high. The adjusted gross returns of like 30%, you know, so it's not, it's not a bad investment at all. In fact, premium education, that means, you know, kind of education to the, to the emerging middle class and the, and the affluent is extremely profitable and could be used as a cash cow, like we talked about earlier, to support um, other other uh, initiatives and other things like, for example, like education to the masses. Th these are things that could be done. And so there's an incredible opportunity around this investment. Now, let me pause right there and talk about this as a kingdom business. The church has been very involved in education in the past. We've seen it taper off. Uh, since the 60s. And then in the six, 50s and 60s, the church began to withdraw from education in Africa. And that vacuum was filled by a lot of other things. But um, they were very, we were very involved in the past. But typically, when folks that have a heart for God and a heart for the nation and a heart for education, when, when they hear about this kind of thing, what the, our typical response is to say, let's pass the hat, let's raise an offering, let's go and start a school in Africa. That's not going to cut it. The scale that's needed, I mean, what, what, we're talking about 800 million people that are going to be seeking education. So we have to think much bigger. <laughs> we can't just pass the hat and go start a school in Africa. And so that's why I'm saying this is a kingdom business opportunity, because the only way that we can respond to this opportunity with the scale that's needed in our generation is if we think of ways to make this self-supporting, self-sustaining, essentially make it into a business. And so there are tremendous opportunities to do that. Uh, Vishal will, I think, will you be touching on, Vishal will be touching on some of the strategies that we're describing that we believe will, will make this work. But the, the, the thing that needs to happen here is we need to fully engage this. So if you have a heart for education, if you have a heart for business, if you have a heart for the nations, if you fall within any one of those circles, my appeal to you is let's not let this opportunity pass us by. And so now I've talked passionately about Africa. But we, I believe that probably the single most concrete strategy that we could employ as the church to save this nation is for the church to recover its mandate to be the educators of the world. And so we're not just talking about Africa. Absolutely Africa. It's not an either or, right? This isn't binary. This isn't whether or not we respond to an opportunity in the nations or whether or not we do it in the United States. We have to do it in our Jerusalem in our Judea, and our Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. But my appeal to you is let's seize the opportunity. I, you know, I believe that the church right now in America and around the world are crying out for concrete, actionable strategies to make a difference. I feel like that, that people want to do something. Well, what we're talking about here tonight, what Vishal will explain in much more detail, 
is a concrete, actionable strategy to change the world, and that is to disciple the nations. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I always love listening to Jason talk. Um, you see how it takes more than just the uh, the church mind, the church mountain to build. We have to work when you combine church and business thinking. Um, Jason's just got an incredible mind for business, and I hear it every time he talks, so I love that. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Mark Harris. So Dr. Mark Harris was raised in a nominal Christian home in Idaho, and became a Christian in 1978, a year after graduating from college and becoming a CPA. He decided to turn his attention to ministry and graduated in 1984 with a master's in New Testament from Western Seminary. After graduation, he continued as an accountant and then in 1993 moved to Russia where he was involved in evangelism and pastor training. He also completed his doctorate in intercultural studies, studying the effects of Western evangelism among Russian youth. Upon returning to the USA in 2002, he continued traveling and teaching overseas and also built up his accounting business that served mostly Christian nonprofits. He is currently president or CFO for five Christian nonprofits and adjunct professor in global studies for Liberty University. He and his wife live in Lynchburg, Virginia. Please welcome Dr. Mark Harris. I hope you can see you're getting a uh, sort of a mixed bag of, of uh, presentations from the book. The book has many chapters, and all of us are looking at things from a slightly different angle. My appeal is uh, very similar to what you've just heard. Those who are interested in uh, looking to missions, uh, how education uh, should impact the nations outside of the U.S., and uh, so this should show you sort of the scale of our vision. It's not, it's not just one thing. It's really an all-encompassing vision. Usually, we're most familiar with educational problems and the methods that are being used in our own context. We grew up with them. We observe them every day. And we have ideas on how to fix things in our own culture toward an ideal. But the ideal is often an ideal that's, that exists within our Western cultural assumptions. And the missionary tasks often follow suit. We try to export our solutions as if it were a package deal. Not just the substance, but also the form. How we do things. It's, it's one thing to think about the, the truths that are universal. But it's another thing to think about how different cultures do things. What are their different values? And how can those be utilized in order to advance whether it's the church, education, business, whatever it is. And so my chapter, which is really just a brief introduction to the topic, is looking at the ultimate uh, purpose of a revolution, that it take root around the world. Now, a lot of what you see when Westerners go overseas, well, I would compare to a potted plant. You can take a potted plant from anywhere, and you can go place it, you can go, for example, you could go to, let's say you were going to be a missionary in Antarctica, but you wanted to plant palm trees. You could create a potted plant palm tree, but what would you do with it? You'd have to put it inside a structure. You'd have to put heat into it. You'd have to uh, allow it to grow, and then you could have people come and look at it. But that will never, ever, ever take root in the culture because it's not suited for that particular location. But that's often what we're trying to do. We create artificial structures that cannot multiply. I saw this in Russia all the time. Westerners were creating Western-looking churches, and they always attracted a lot of young people. But what was the reason? The young people wanted to become Westerners. They wanted to leave Russia. But it could never multiply and become a Russian phenomenon because it looked too much like an American thing. And uh, always a tremendous problem. But it's actually really true in education. And in, in my chapter, I give several examples. I'll just mention a few of them. Uh, one, w one thing we often look at is uh, different dimensions of culture. For example, the, the idea of power distance. How does a culture see how far is the leader 
from the people who are being led. In education, Americans like to have a smaller and smaller power distance where we're kind of friends with the instructor. And uh, that hasn't always been that way, but that's been the, the direction that it's gone. Uh, good example of the opposite is a place like Japan or Korea, where th when the professor's speaking, everybody's listening, and people are even afraid that you don't really even ask questions. All you do is write down madly whatever they're saying and get it written down and then repeat it to them exactly as they gave it to you. Now, as a Westerner, we might look and say, well, that's just a bad way of doing things. But when you have that level of respect for your professor, you, tend, you can really tend to learn a lot. You can imag imagine how much you can cram into your head. Uh, and if you've got an excellent professor, you're going to learn in a, in a way that our, our Western students often don't because they're constantly questioning and they finish the term and they don't even remember what they learned. Uh, the, another example is... Um, individualism and collectivism. Uh, American uh, Western cultures in general are very individualistic. Everything separates people so you can stand alone. But collective cultures think very differently. They think, how do I fit in a culture in a group? My identity is really my group identity, starting with my family and then my tribe or whatever it is. To try to pull them out and separate them uh, causes great stress. Well, that often is uh, the problem we deal with in, in education. Is when you're looking at a group of students, you have to think, how are they thinking about how they relate to each other in this educational process? Um, another example is uh, learning styles. <coughs> Excuse me. Learning styles. Uh, an example I give is uh, synthetic versus analytic. Synthetic is where you're taking everything you learn and you're, you're synthesizing it together and you're looking at how does everything I'm learning compare to everything else. Whereas analytic, which is, tends to be a little bit more of a Western idea, is we try to isolate, pull it out by itself completely and look at it just by itself. Well, people who are studying things synthetically will say, well, you, you distort the picture when you look at it like that because this subject relates to every other subject. And if, you do, if you're studying it separately, you're not going to gain the whole picture. Um, and uh, so when you go into a culture, you have to understand <coughs> what, are their, what do they value in how they think and how they learn. Because their values can result in tremendous growth and understanding. And developing their biblical, a biblical worldview really oftentimes depends upon making sure that you leverage the way they think and the things they value and we're not talking about biblical and non-biblical values. We're just talking about ranges of cultural values. Uh, another good example I like to uh, have experienced with my own life is are you, are you trying to teach concepts or are you trying to teach skills? Now, when I was uh, studying accounting, we studied it very analytically. We looked at every little piece separately. So we're looking at fixed assets one time, and now we're looking at accounts receivable, and you're separating them out and analyzing them. And you were able to regurgitate in an exam what these things were, and I was able to do that. I was really good at studying and taking exams. I went on to my job, and I, I felt like I knew nothing because I'd, I'd never really seen it all together. I felt really like uh, I didn't know anything about accounting. And someone from a, a skills development would have said, well, well, of course, day one, you should have put them into a job, give them tasks to do. And then as they do the tasks, they're going to master the subject. And you can add the, the, the ideas later. But we, we think that just the opposite. And a lot of our, our students are being, they're failing when they go out into the world because uh, they, they were trained to memorize and regurgitate, but they weren't really trained how to do what they're being, what they're being taught. This is actually true in pastor training as well. Uh, a lot of our young men are not being trained to be a pastor. They're, they're being really given a good biblical education, but a lot of them are just terrible on, as pastors. They've never really been uh, trained on the job. Now, Usually there is some sort of a mentoring going on at the same time, but 
if you're expecting the seminary to train a pastor, you're expecting the wrong thing. Pastors are really trained in community. So when we glorify God, we have to glorify God in the world in, a, in multicolored ways, in many, many different ways. What I like to close with a quote that always comes back to me when I think about, about this. We were, uh, this is in the mid-90s, and I was a part of a, a group of uh, Russian, uh, Western trainers training Russian pastors. And one time a young man got up in one of our meetings, and he said, you know, what we'd really like you to do is bring us the principles. We just love that. Bring us the principles, but then let us apply them. Let us take them and apply them. Because they knew their people, and they knew, that they knew the, the structures that they were dealing with, and we didn't. So we were trying to give them, give them too much. So uh, as we think about the vision of education, I think we really have to think that way. We have to have a high level of respect for the wisdom that only comes to leaders who grew up in their own culture. They know their own people. And the more they, we lo they lose, uh, that we don't have respect for them, and we make them sort of puppets of a Western approach, they'll fail. They'll always fail. And, uh, but we're not talking about failure. We're talking about success here. So uh, it, I think... Um, when we, when we think about the, the spread of, of, a, of a vision, you always have to let uh, the vision be as much more general. Let the very specific applications be determined locally. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris. That was excellent. Uh, so our keynote tonight is uh, Vishal Mangawadi. He's become a uh, friend. Um, uh, before I read his bio, um, uh, my wife and I were really impacted by a book that he wrote called The Book That Made Your World. Uh, it was about, uh, about the Bible and how it created the soul of Western civilization. And anywhere you saw human flourishing taking place in a nation, anywhere in the world, uh, you could trace it back to the Bible, the, uh, to, to the source of truth. It was so powerful. And I read it once, and I thought... That seemed important, and I put it on the shelf. And a couple of years later, my wife and I were talking about it, and and because she had read it too, and and we're like, you know, I think we need to get back to what we read in that book. And so we we started a group in our home. We actually taught through the book twice uh, in the course of a year. It took <laughs> it takes about six months to get through it if you go through it a chapter a week, but it was really powerful, and um, and. The more we got, the more I started going through the book again. I mean, it takes time to really understand these things and to have something of a, a mind shift uh, to understand the types of things that he's talking about. Um, and I saw it as uh, really the missing piece uh, that in no matter what church or denomination I was in, what group I was talking to, um, uh, it seemed like the missing piece was was just getting back to the power of truth that builds nations. The Bible builds nations. Um, so anyway, I found it very powerful. So let me read his uh, bio to you. So Christianity Today has called Vishal Mangawadi India's foremost Christian intellectual. Uh, Jerry Bowyer, Bo Bower, I'm not sure how to say his last name, a financial economist, Marks Vishal as one of the founders of the next great worldwide phase of Christian civilization. Vishal was born in 1949 in central India. He studied philosophy in the universities of Allahabad, uh, and uh, BA in Indoor MA, in various Hindu ashrams, and in Labri Fellowship in Switzerland. That's Francis Schaeffer, if you're unfamiliar. In 1976, along with his wife Ruth, he founded a community to serve the rural poor in a village in India. His first book, The World of Gurus, was published in 1977. It became an instant bestseller in India, and many universities use it as a textbook on contemporary Hinduism. California's William Carey International University honored his literary and social work with a Doctor of Laws and appointed him in, as an adjunct professor. 
Between 2014 and 2016, he served as the Honorary Professor of Applied Theology and the Director of the Center for Human Resource Development at Sam Higginbottom University of Agriculture, Technology, and Sciences in Allahabad, India. <coughs> Vishal Mangalwadi has lectured in 40 countries and continues to travel, travel around the world. Many of his 21 books have been translated in several languages in Europe, South America, and Asia. The book that made your world, How the Bible Created the Soul of Western Civilization, 2011, is revolutionizing how we understand the impact of the Bible in the modern world. Vishal's following book is called This Book Changed Everything. There's a few of them back there on the table as well. The Bible's Amazing Impact on Our World, which is available now in Kindle and will soon be available in print. In his book, Truth and Transformation, this was the first book that I read, uh, A Manifesto for Ailing Nations, uh, published by YWAM in 2009, Vishal proposed that American, America can be reformed by turning local churches into college classrooms using web-based curriculum under academic pastors. That proposal has birthed several initiatives around the world. Currently, Vishal is preparing to launch this education revolution in Africa, Asia, and South America. Vishal's latest book is The Third Education Revolution, featuring nearly 30 contributing authors from across the globe. We have four of them here tonight. Uh, it advocates a partnership between church, university, and technology, making high-quality education affordable to virtually everyone. Please welcome Vishal Mangawadi. Thank you, Joseph, and thank you, Pastor and the Church. Uh, it, thank you, Serve Initiative. It is wonderful to be back here. And well, two years ago, we were talking about this third education revolution. Now that the book is launched, I will take just a few minutes to give a global perspective and then try and focus on America. Uh, while I was serving as a professor of applied theology in India, uh, one day one of my students asked me to visit a slum across the river. I was on one bank of the river. The university didn't like us swimming, so we had to take a bicycle around to the slum. Um, when we got there, there, we saw a young man, just about 17 years old, uh, teaching 40 or so young people, uh, they were all sitting on the street. On both sides, the parents, mothers, sisters were cooking, washing, doing their chores, and the kids were just sitting on the street, and he was teaching them. And uh, the kids were excited that a university professor had come. So at the end, they stood up, uh, to honor me with his song. They were all from Hindu homes, but they were singing uh, Glory to Jesus. That was amazing. I was very impressed by this young man. Nobody was paying him. He was just spending four or five evenings on his own initiative uh, to educate these kids. So I invited this young man to come and have dinner with me on Saturday, which he did and uh, spent the night there, and then he, we became friends. Every weekend he will come and spend the night with me. When we'd become good friends, we'll walk and talk and pray. When we'd become good friends, he said to me that, sir, I don't think that I will pass my high school exam, uh, with the 12th grade in India, I don't think I'll pass my high school exam this year. Why? I can't understand mathematics. Some of my class fellows understand what the teacher is saying, uh, but that is because they take private tuition. His sister-in-law runs a tuition uh, class. You pay her. The master himself teaches, but legally he's not allowed to do private coaching, so it's his sister-in-law who does that. Uh, so they understand him. The rest of the class doesn't understand. I have a second problem. My, uh, f my family is 100 miles away in a village. My father thinks that village school is useless. So he sent me to the city school, uh, assuming that the teachers are better. I live with four boys. They have all dropped out of school. They work. 
when the television is on 24 hours, I ca cannot concentrate. Exams are just three months away. So I invited him to move in with me. I gave him a desktop and uh, started him on khanacademy.com. Khanacademy.com is a mathematics teaching program at that time funded by Bill Gates and others. Bill Gates' own daughter studied math using that program. Now, the program was in English. He could read English, but he couldn't understand it. So I helped him to use Google Translate to translate math uh, problems. Uh, and then uh, my dining table became his English classroom. And to teach him English, we decided to use Hindi English bilingual Bible that he would read in Hindi and he would read in English and try and understand. So the dining table became a conversation where he's learning English, he's learning the biblical worldview, learning history and apologetics, etc. Uh, and uh, uh, to cut a long story short, three months later, he passed his intermediate in first division uh, because he was spending hours and hours and hours learning math and was very excited. This program was so good because every time you did something wrong, it reinforced you with points. Now, what um, once he had done his exam, I got him a bicycle and he started going to the next slum uh, also to uh, run a teaching program for these slum kids. Now, what this uh, young man needed was not a highly qualified, well-paid math teacher. What he needed was a pastor, a shepherd, someone who loved him, someone who cared for him. The uh, Khan Academy could teach him math. I didn't have to teach him math. But he needed a shepherd. This is what a pastor master, Paul identifies himself in 1 Timothy and Titus chapter 1, that I'm an apostle means that I'm a preacher and a teacher of the truth to Gentiles. As a preacher, I cultivate faith. As a teacher, I impart knowledge of the truth to Gentiles. So an apostle is a pastor master. This was an idea that came to India with 19th century, early 20th century missionaries, that the pastor was also the master, the preacher and a teacher. But with professionalization and secularization of education, this uh, concept has disappeared. A preacher is a preacher. He has no interest in teaching truth. And a teacher has no interest in cultivating faith, in cultivating character. Now, second snapshot, uh, in that book, Truth and Transformation, that uh, I published in 2009 with YWAM Publishing, in the last appendix was this proposal for a new education revolution, that American church has the capacity to disciple America, it does not have the theology of discipling nations, which is a major problem. Uh, if a church like this took 15 students uh, and one academic pastor supervising those 15 students, students will enroll in a university, let's say in Regent University, but professors will come to the church every day online Students will gather together, three, four students sitting here studying law, and a few students sitting there st studying history or science or whatever. Uh, students, uh, they are overseen by an academic pastor who is like homeschooling parent version 2.0 or a youth pastor version 2.0 who is interested not just in their faith but also in their academic life. So we call him academic pastor. That's what my role with this young man was. So this is a pastoral care uh, where I care for the sheep, not just for my job as a teacher, part of a teacher's union. 
so uh, th this proposal in uh, 2009 was uh, presented to America. The book was released in Houston, Texas. If one church took 15 students with one academic pastor, uh, 100,000 churches in America would have 1.5 million students in the church every day. In second year, a second pastor, academic pastor with 15 students, American church will have 3 million students in the church every day. Um, in a four-year program, American church can be discipling anywhere from four to six million students every single day. One student point, paying $10,000 uh, a year. So if Regent is charging 40,000, fees comes down to 10,000. 5,000 stays with the church. So 15 students times five is $75,000 in the church. Church can pay $50,000 to the academic pastor and $25,000 for utilities and ad, uh, administrative assistant. And you have two academic pastors. You have uh, um, $150,000 here. And uh, university will not become poor. University will become richer because now the university can have 3 million students instead of 5,000 students. They can pay their teachers well, and they can give a lot of leisure time to the teacher so that Christian professors from Christian universities have time to research and win Nobel Prizes. In 100 years, no Christian university has produced one professor who has won one Nobel Prize because professor, it's not they don't have the ability, but they are very busy. They are uh, doing too much. If you are having to repeat the same lecture every year, that's a waste of your time. You record it once, let students hear it, uh, hear it several times, because uh, that has tremendous advantage. The student can pause the professor and he can rewind the professor. And when the professor is done, you can replay the professor uh, until you have really understood. And the professor has the time to study and keep improving his lecture as and when he wants to. So this is a revolution. The revolution is that for a thousand years, the church has sent students to the university. Now this program will compel universities to send students to the church. If a university says, no, 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 we want $40,000 a year, and we are quite content with have 5,000 students or 6,000 students, yet that university will self-destruct because th there are already Christian universities coming on board that are willing to lower the price from 40,000 a year to 10,000 a year. So universities will self-destruct if they do not uh, come on board. And uh, uh, now, unfortunately, uh, given the theology of the American church, the American church was not interested in that proposal in 2009. But in that conference in Houston, there were five Indonesians. They picked up a copy each, and on the plane back to Jakarta, they began reading. And um, by the time they had landed in Jakarta, they said, we won this book in Indonesian. They began translating, didn't ask anybody, author or the publisher, just started publishing. And once it had been translated, they emailed me, will you please come and launch the book? So I said, sure. I went there, and uh, they called for a national leadership conference. They called it Transform Indonesia. So I said to them that you actually can transform Indonesia. What you need to do is to turn 10,000 churches into centers of hybrid education. So Muslim students will come to church, including to study practical subjects such as agriculture. All the theory will be on the screen, in the books. Students will help each other. They will do practicals in their own villages, on mo in model farms. There will be an agriculture extension officer who will go to Monday morning here, Monday afternoon there. 
and uh, uh, if he cannot solve a particular problem, all he has to do is to um, Skype, with that in those days, Skype with his professor and say that here is a problem, what do we do? And if, prob if the professor cannot solve the problem, professor will say that dig up that plant and the soil and send a student uh, to the lab here in the, to the university where uh, professors will try and understand and solve the problem and uh, instruct how to take care of this problem, how to do the soil analysis, etc. Students will go to the university physically to uh, do those things such as practicals which you cannot do in the church or you cannot do in model farms such as soil testing or uh, actually driving a harvester or tractor, etc. Or, or maintaining some of the technology related to agriculture. So for those, you will go to the university, but you don't need to invest four years, six years living in a dorm. Now, so Indonesia program got going in 2010. We went there and we launched the first center in a Presbyterian church come high school in the same campus. We had to put up a 50 meter high antenna to get signal. I won't uh, go into the Indonesian story because it's there in the book. You can read the development of it, uh, what has been happening, and now a major funder has come on board after one and a half years of investigation. What can I do for Indonesia? He's interested in Muslim uh, missions, Muslim, Muslim evangelism. And uh, his one and a half years of investigation led him, he's Korean, that the best thing happening is in Indonesia. And he publicly began to commit that this is what he would like to finance and invest in. But I want to take a, a, a leap forward, another snapshot from Uganda, um, uh, and thank you for that wonderful presentation, Jason. Um, in 2019, that's just two and a half, two years ago, uh, one denomination, uh, which is, they call themselves association, one uh, association of born-again Pentecostals in Uganda, 30,000 churches, they invited me to meet with their leaders for five days. So 240 Christian leaders in Uganda came together, spent five days. We met in an Anglican university. And uh, we studied passages such as Isaiah 11. Uh, does God intend to baptize his uh, servant with a spirit of irrationality? Or does he intend to baptize his servant with spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, might, power, fear of the Lord, etc.? After five days, those 240 Christian leaders unanimously voted that we want to turn every one of our 30,000 churches into centers of digital education. Can you help us uh, train academic pastors? Help us with online K through 12 curriculum and college curriculum. The pastors have to learn how to educate themselves, get a high school diploma using a laptop, and uh, then they have to be able to help students. Once they get an, uh, a, an accredited high school, they get, get into an accredited BA in applied theology, uh, which is different than systematic theology in that you're actually training them to be mentors. You're giving them an understanding of economic transformation of a nation. You're teaching them how the biblical worldview actually sets individuals and nations free, uh, etc. So you are applying theology for all of life which is what education was in America uh, earlier. Um, and uh, so uh, this movement, which uh, in January of 2019, that's 10 years after that book was published, um, they uh, resolved. So as a result, we uh, called for a consultation in Phoenix, Arizona, in the summer of 2019, about 40 people from um, 13 or 14 nations came together, all at their own expense. And um, 
we uh, consulted with each other. There were several universities uh, from Africa that were uh, represented there. Uh, one of the universities in Uganda was started by Food for the Hungry and is run by the Koreans in Uganda. The vice chancellor came and he was really excited because here are Koreans who have been struggling to educate Uganda and he invited us to continue the consultation in uh, mm, uh, South Korea. So in February of 2020, last year, we were about, again, 30, 40 of us were in Korea meeting uh, with the group of people from different countries, but also the Koreans during the last, South Koreans during the last several decades have established 42 universities. When American missions are emphasizing orality and story, uh, Korean missions are emphasizing building universities in uh, different countries. So about 20 or 22 countries together have uh, created one association. Their leadership spent time with us. The we need help. Uh, we as Koreans have done what we can do like we can teach math, we can teach science, but we can't teach English, etc. So we need partnership with you. So uh, that, uh, while we were in South Korea, the COVID hit, and my wife, I was on my way to India for two months, and Africa and Europe, and my wife said, uh, no, you come back to our daughter's home, because she was babysitting uh, our grandchildren. So uh, during this COVID season, don't travel. So I came back. And uh, I was confined to, we, we don't have a home. Our home was burned down by a mob of Hindus. So uh, uh, I was confined to my granddaughter's bedroom because she was stranded in India. And uh, I uh, was, this whole book we created, 30 of us created this book in 100 days. But publishing, it took a long time uh, because this is not a sort of book that average Christian publisher would publish. Uh, so we self-published it and are promoting it now. Uh, but um, the, the uh, consequence of it is that having been confined uh, to our homes, we began to use Zoom to pray with all of these people from around the world. So every Wednesday we pray about last, yesterday there were 43 people. And we've started a number of writing projects. Uh, we uh, Today, uh, every Thursday, we have a session in India, 9 p.m. India time, where we are studying how the Bible created modern India. So you have done a lot of work here. Steve has done, Face has done, on the Bible's impact in shaping America. Uh, it's part of Carla's book as well. Uh, but not many people realize that modern India and modern China and modern Indonesia and modern Korea, these are all products of the Bible. Uh, there were 500 American missionaries who went to South Korea uh, out of D.L. Moody's revivals who created modern Korea. But Koreans don't know that uh, because uh, it's not just the secularists who don't believe in history. We don't believe in history. We don't know history. American church doesn't know American history. That, that's why you have to read a Providential History of America, which uh, the Providence Foundation has published, etc. cetera. The, the, the Bible as the soul of America, Bible as the soul of Africa, uh, what has uh, God done through these men and women, missionaries who dedicated their lives to go to these nations and transform. So uh, to uh, begin to wind up, the third education revolution, what is the first and the second? I won't talk about it because you have to read the first chapter to understand the first revolution was Carolingian Renaissance in eighth and ninth century. Second revolution was what Martin Luther began in 1520. And this is the third education revolution uh, in which the church will finally have to uh, be awakened and take responsibility because Paul says 
in 1 Timothy 2, 4. God wants all men to be saved and go to heaven. Right? No, that's what the evangelists say. God's, uh, Paul says God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants all men to be saved. Truth has disappeared from the church, and that's why truth has disappeared from the university. What the history teachers were teaching is what uh, both Plato and Aristotle has, had written, that history has no meaning. In Macbeth, Shakespeare put it, puts it this way, life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. It has no meaning. Without alpha and omega, without the beginning and the end, history has no meaning. So the British government has stopped funding history departments because without alpha and omega, history has no meaning. So the Western int uh, intellectual life is disintegrating. Maybe I should give just one illustration. The Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. If you ask average high school student in America, how many of you believe that, uh, how, to how many of you is it self-evident that all men are created equal? 99% students will say, we don't believe that all men are created. We don't believe any man is created. We've all evolved. So did we evolve equal? Evolution is a theory to explain in inequality. Inequality is self-evident. So the very foundation of American civilization has been destroyed by American education and we can talk, spend hours talking about it, uh, that very foundation of American society has been destroyed uh, by uh, American education. And if America has to s survive and be reformed and uh, a renaissance needed, and this means the church has to take education back because Paul goes on to say in 1 Timothy 3.15, the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. If Harvard has given up veritas or truth, it is because evangelical theology gave up truth. That's a very strong statement, and you're not going to believe that, uh, but, and I won't take the time to uh, defend myself now, uh, but... Uh, on uh, uh, on the internet, you can find several versions of one of my essays called Why Christianity Lost America, where I illustrate this point, that the biggest problem with the American church is that we have amazing grace, we have no um, uh, celebration of amazing truth, the revealed truth, uh, the, because epistemology, theory of knowledge, etc., disappeared. Uh, in America um, since independence, but we don't have the time to go into all of that. Uh, my point now is that if this experiment of liberty has to succeed, the church has to become the pillar and foundation of the truth. The simple fact is that it was never self-evident to any culture it was never self-evident to America that all men are created equal. Slaves and slave owners are equal. Male and females are equal. These were never self-evident truth. These are revealed truth, and Thomas Jefferson knew that. And therefore, in the original document of the Declaration of Independence, he wrote, we hold these truths to be sacred, revealed in sacred scriptures. Under pressure from Benjamin Franklin, that language was changed, but uh, the, not for today. We won't go into those details today. The point is that if ideas of human equality, human rights, that all men are endowed with inalienable human rights, these are all revealed truths. They are not self-evident truths. 
if the foundations have to be repaired, the church has to take education back. Because now you have handed over education to people who do not know the difference between male and female. People who do not know what is love and what is marriage and what is sex and what is family and what is a nation, what is justice. They are educating America. So you have to take education back. And this is not about K through 12. Uh, we need 100,000 of you to help create a new encyclopedia online. We have to create a whole ecosystem. You take a sh small subject, you contribute to a new encyclopedia. Out of that will flow all the curriculum from kindergarten to university level. Out of that will flow new dictionaries online. So globally, we need students, everybody to come to our encyclopedia, our dictionary, uh, that we have to take back the control of language because now you're being educated by English teachers who don't know what is a father, what's a mother, etc. So this is a total intellectual revolution which has to take on the economic might of the state. The church handed over education to the state because church didn't have the authority to tax people and pay the teachers. We're Davids before Goliath. Can we really take on the economic might of the ch state? Yes, we can. How? You have get the book and read it. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, I will be happy to talk more about it. We lower the cost of tuition ridiculously. We can give entire medical curriculum for $100 a year online. There is enough expertise in the world to create medical encyclopedia, which out of which comes medical curriculum, which can be given to students for $100 a year. Nobody needs to go to a medical university to memorize the bones in human body. You come to church, three students come to church, wa walk around here on their cell phones. They memorize the bones in human body. They watch on these screens how to fix bones when bones go wrong. Uh, when they actually have to fix bone, then they go to the local hospital, which is partnering with the university and uh, uh, the church, which is partnering with the university. And we can drastically lower the cost of education and create a microfinancing of education cooperative banks uh, which will provide in Uganda, in Indonesia, laptops and software and tuition fee to students. I'll stop there. It is a revolution which has to take on the economic might of the state. It is a revolution which has to take on the intellectual expertise that is there in these universities that no longer know what is male and what is female. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vishal. Um, yeah, I love the, uh, the first sentence of this book he mentioned in his talk. For a thousand years, the church has sent students to the universities. It is time for universities to send students to the local church. Um, yeah, the first chapter in this book, get the book, just read the first chapter, start there, you'll, you'll read the whole thing. Uh, don't be intimidated. Um, it's very heavy. You could wound somebody with this. Be careful. But it's, it's really powerful. It's very powerful. Tonight, uh, we would like to honor Vishal. We want to take up an offering, a love offering for him. Uh, so in just a moment, uh, we're going to have some ushers come, uh, come around and uh, receive a love offering for him. Um, what I want to say about it is that this is a lot of love offerings are pitched as um, we're giving to people's needs. 
um, I want you to see this, that we're investing in a movement. Um, we're investing in a movement and in a movement maker. In the kingdom of God, when we discover someone that in whom God has invested so much, uh, and, they've, and we find that they're being faithful to the call of God on their life, um, then uh, we need to ask how we can resource them. Uh, how can we put fuel in the fire and really help this go farther? Um, every time I hear about uh, Vishal, he is, uh, he's up late, he's up early, he's traveling the world. When he came to this location, uh, this venue, for the Serve Initiative's um, first uh, event, uh, January of 2019, he flew to us all the way from Brazil. And so, I mean, he's bouncing around the world, and he is doing this. And uh, I'm I'm sitting in my living room, and I'm getting texts from friends of mine from um, um, uh, from not Portland, yeah, no, from Bend, Oregon, and they're sending me pictures of Vishal in Germany, uh, where they're at for a conference. I mean, he's bouncing all around the world. So we're investing in a movement, and uh, I just want to give you the opportunity to be a part of that tonight, uh, because. Um, we are discipling nations uh, in doing this. Um, so there are three ways to give tonight. Uh, and Ryan, Simon, you guys can come up front. Uh, just come up front for a minute. Um, there's three ways you can give cash, check, or card. And uh, in just a moment, someone's going to come around to collect the offering. If you're writing a check, you can make it payable to Grace River Church, and we'll get it to Vishal. And if you're giving by a credit card, um, if you grab your... Um, program, which I have misplaced, if you grab your program, the second QR code on there, you can scan that, and uh, it'll take you, again, just follow the link, and there's a drop-down menu, and it says Give to Vishal, and you can use that and give by credit card very simply. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to just take a quick second and pray. We're going to receive the offering, and we're going to get ready and close in just a moment. So Father, tonight, God, as we receive this offering, Lord, for Vishal, we pray, Lord, that, Lord, that you would let this thing fuel reformation all over the world, fuel reformation, fuel a, a revolution in education. God, let it touch nations and transform the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, we're going to wrap it up in just a second here. So I just want to thank all of the speakers. Please give them all a round of applause. They are, what they're doing is amazing. Thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, Face, to Serve, and to the Providence Foundation uh, for co hosting this. A special thanks to uh, Dr. John McLeod, pastor of Grace River Church here for letting us use his beautiful sanctuary uh, for this event. Um, and finally, I want to thank all of you for coming out and investing in this Jesus-centric education. It's not simply what tonight's speakers and organizations are doing to create a revolution in education. It's what you are doing and what you will do uh, in response to God's leading in your lives in this area. Uh, John, would you come and pray, uh, close us in prayer tonight? Thank you. Father, we thank you for your presence. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be a part of what we know needs to happen, but beginning to have the boldness to say it. What we know needs to be said, but, but Father, uh, unless your people who are called by your name are willing to humble themselves and pray, reach out to you, Lord, in ways that, that we never could have thought imagined. Lord, it's, it may feel radical, 
but it's because we've not done it for a long time. Lord, I pray that you just anoint us. I pray that you use us. Let everyone here, Lord, not only go home and be safe, but be challenged to be moved on by your Holy Spirit. Thank you tonight, Father, for these incredible speakers and what they have brought us and challenged us with. Bless us, strengthen us, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, and after you, there, Vishal has uh, the Third Education Revolution and a few other of his books back there on the table. As you get one of them or multiple, he's back there signing uh, out just outside those double doors. Thank you, and uh, have a good night.